two major parties are no closer on any policy solution on asylum seekers. And while they slug it out in the Parliament, a fair turnout of MPs and Senators is expected this morning to convene in Tony Windsor's office again to try and find or discuss anyway some kind of new way forward on asylum seeker policy. The Greens human rights spokesperson, Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, will be attending. She's in our Parliament House studios too. Senator Hanson-Young, good morning. Good morning, Fran. Thanks for having me. I understand you've spent the past few days speaking with experts in refugee law and protection um, across the region, in countries in the region. What are they telling you? What kind of solution or regional solution are they talking about? Well, they're talking about uh, the need for a cooperative relationship with Australia and and the countries that they're working in. This is Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, some of the Asia Pacific um, uh, outer areas as well. And they're saying very clearly that they're concerned that if we continue to go down this track from Australia's perspective of of purely focusing um, the solutions or so-called solutions on domestic politics, it's actually going to undermine all of the efforts that are being put in to lift levels of protection in the region. They're concerned that the idea of uh, offshore processing uh, in this kind of bilateral way in Malaysia or indeed Nauru uh, won't do anything to lift uh, the protection needs of asylum seekers across the region. So it doesn't actually take away the need for asylum seekers to continue to board boats, whether whether it's to Australia or if Australia stops, um, uh, you know, starts turning boats around and stops taking them, perhaps they'll even go on to New Zealand, which would be an even more dangerous boat trip. But so they uh, really just, want... Just to interrupt you there, if, you t- if they're talking about a cooperative la- relationship with Australia, I'm sure the Labor government would claim that's what they've been trying to negotiate with Malaysia and that they have got cooperation from Malaysia on a few fronts in, in terms of improved protections and conditions for asylum seekers. Uh, only for those uh, eight hundred that Australia would be sending back. It's under they've been very concerned. The the experts in these countries who have been negotiating with their governments are very concerned that the Australian negotiations thus far have been undermining the the very important work that they've been doing. What they want to see instead is incentives that Australia can give to their countries to lift protections across the board because they know that even if people can sign up with the UNHCR in Malaysia, there's no safety guarantee. There. There's actually no safety guaranteed even for those that Australia sends there and that's why the High Court, of course, struck down the deal in the first place because those protections couldn't be guaranteed in law. One of the things that they've been uh, calling for is direct earmarked funding for the UNHCR so that they can get through more assessment cases and be able to communicate effectively with the thousands of people that are still waiting to know the results of their applications but also, of course, giving some basic level uh legal framework for people to be able to stay legally in these countries while they have their claims assessed. There's a number of NGOs working in the region who have asked Australia for uh, funding to help them provide support uh, basis for uh, asylum seekers because at the moment there is no legal protection. So it's some of the urgent things that we can be doing. Of course they can want I, Australia to clar- show... To, to, of course they also want Australia to lift our humanitarian intake. And I, I, I heard your interview, of course, with Professor Mayle as well and and that is something that Australia needs to start doing. So just to clarify, just trying to be clear here, what these these people in these countries are saying, Australia to help invest in the uh, humane processing of people um, who are seeking asylum in the countries, uh, the source countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, for instance, um, more money for UNHCR to get the processing done more quickly. But then what? with a commitment to resettle more people and a commitment to help those people who are still waiting for resettlement be given legal protection. So giving incentives to Malaysia and Indonesia to lift that standard. It's in Australia's interest to get Malaysia and Indonesia in particular to give a higher level of legal safeguards to these people so that they don't feel like they have to keep running. If we, but can unless, I just unless they feel safe, they will board that next boat. I understand that, but but even if they have legal protections, that means they're staying in these countries. And these countries presumably um, are finding this a burden, all these people here, a cost burden. Why would they agree with anything that's going to leave them, in a sense, lumped with all these people to protect? Mm. If uh, 
and and even if Australia doubled its intake, I think that's the Greens' position to twenty five thousand. That's going to barely make a blip on the number of people there. Well, that's why we the the experts in the field and those who work in the region, as well as here in Australia, the UNHCR, Amnesty International, Australian Refugee Council, are saying let's have a look at what worked in the past. Uh, in the past, under the Fraser government, there were some um, very clear cooperation uh, agreements about how many people other countries would resettle. Not everybody came to Australia. But that was a one-off with a one-off group of people. I mean, that was easier perhaps for a number of countries to get their head around. This is an ongoing flow. And even even if there were these strengths and protections for people um, at source, then you know, that some of them aren't still... They're not, not going to sit around and wait three years. They're still going to jump on boats, aren't they? Well, the very clear evidence that these organisations have and what we were being briefed on this week, they've done... They've been monitoring these groups of people uh, for a number of years and the, and, and, and the waves of people coming from different areas, whether it's Afghanistan or Sri Lanka or Burma, uh, actually talking to them about what is it that would stop them from boarding boats. And they clearly say that if they understood... Um, what the time frames were at the moment. The if if you be as crude as to say there is a waiting list, the waiting list in Malaysia would be seventy six years. So if we can try and do something to uh, put a put a dent in that, that would obviously help. But uh, even but the trebling, thing, even trebling the intake is going to bring it back what to. 25 years? But it's not just a role for Australia, Fran, and this is the point. We need to be getting other countries involved in this cooperation. Uh, there are 22 resettling countries who operate through the UNHCR. Australia needs to be showing leadership and saying, let's get these countries involved in resettling this large number of people that we know are in this kind of backlog in Malaysia and Indonesia. Currently, Australia is taking uh, a pitiful amount from uh, Indonesia and Malaysia an average of 60 people per year at, from at, these countries at, over the last decade. At the moment, I think we heard a pretty... Um he sounded frustrated anyway. Immigration Minister Chris Bowen yesterday because he's committed to the Malaysia solution. You're calling for strength and protections for refugees in Malaysia. If that was achieved, does that mean the Greens could support the Malaysia transfer agreement? Because what seems clear at the moment is the current system, which is all onshore processing, which has been had been the Greens position, is not working. And it seems to be leading to increasing fatalities. Do you accept that? Look, Fran, what we've always said is that you have onshore assessment for the people who arrive here, but that can't be done in isolation to a regional cooperation framework. And I've been saying for many years, and I and I and I went to the government after the High Court deal was struck down and said what we now need to do is really ramp up our operations in the region to lift protection standards to find ways that we can give incentives to Malaysia and Indonesia in particular to lift their standard protections so that people don't have to keep running and hiding. But in the short term, what do we do to stop a boat coming next month? The Department of Immigration's advice to the government was that even the threat of the Malaysia solution stopped the boats. Is it worth doing that in the short term, even if the government commits to what you're suggesting? I really want to find a way through this, Fran, and I want to be able to work with all sides to do that. But I don't believe, and the experts don't believe, that reducing legal protections for people, uh, turning our back on the Refugee Convention will in any way strengthen protection across the region. We know what happened after the Malaysia deal was announced and we saw boats starting to head to places like New Zealand. That's an even more dangerous boat trip. Or as uh, Professor Maley said, they take a boat in another direction direction. And people want to talk about moral imperatives in this discussion. Surely we have a responsibility to do what we can. And if we are the wealthiest, richest, most well-resourced nation in our region, let's get to our heads together with the, our regional neighbours and say, there is a influx of asylum seekers from the region mm -hmm. at the moment that need help. Actually think about what we can do uh, immediately to to r reduce the need for people to board those boats. Okay. Increasing our resettlement uh, significantly would be a good start. But finding ways of saying to these countries, we will work with you. What do you need to give legal protections in your country so that asylum seekers can have their assessments done faster, quicker and be safe while they're waiting? Senator Hanson-Young, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Fran. Senator Sarah Hanson-Young, the Greens Human Rights Spokesperson. It's 10 minutes to 8.